Hello and welcome to Genealogy Quick Start. I'm Shamel Jordan, your host. Philly Cam is the home of Genealogy Quick Start. You can watch us on Philly Cam. You can also watch us live on Facebook and YouTube. It's very nice to have you here today. We are going to do something today that I have no idea what we're doing. Like seriously, I have no clue. So I'm going to be learning along with you. It's something called patronymics. And guess who's doing that? You know who's doing that. Crossing the patronymic pond with Jim and Michael. And you might be wondering, why do I have this hat on today? That is because it was a special request from our special guest, Sheila Benedict. And I can't wait to share with you how I met this wonderful woman all the way from the other coast. She is going to be talking to us today about researching Catholic records. And, you know, this is going to be, you know, a quick start is just that. It's a quick start. But if you take a look at the Genealogy Quick Start Facebook page, you will learn how you can hear more from Sheila on Catholic church records. And it's coming up pretty soon. So let's me bring my buddies on and we can get started with this show. Uh, first up, of course, always is Jim Beidler, columnist and editor. Hello, Jim. Hello, Chanel. Nice to have you on today. Next up is Michael John Neal, uh, author and blogger. Do they say bloggers anymore? Is there a new word for bloggers? Uh, of Genealogy tip of the day. So how are you guys doing today? I'm pretty good. We're just going to go with blogger. Don't leave the L out because then it sounds like something else. <laughs> we'll just, uh... <laughs> Michael, your volume is a little low. Like it seems like sometimes it, it like the connection seems like it's strong sometimes and sometimes it's not. Okay. Let me see what I can do. I'll talk louder. I don't know if that's going to really help or not, but all right. So um, maybe I'm just so loud. No, mine is actually kind of low. I'm turning it up. All right. So you guys have a really interesting one today, and it's going to take me some time to actually understand what's going on. So I want to go ahead and jump right into it. And uh, so today, what we're doing is called, let me change our faces. Da -da. All right. <laughs> Today, the title is Crossing the Patronymic Pond. So what does this mean anyway? Well, I'll, get, I'll give the 30 second summary and then Michael can really elaborate because 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 Mike, Michael really ought to be known as Michael Janssen. Neil, because he's got he's got so many of these patronymic ancestors. Whereas I I have I have only uh, uh, pretty much heard heard of them one time a long time ago. Uh, I had a research client that uh, that I worked with them on. Um, but you know, in most Western cultures, uh, your surname comes down to you unchanged from your father. You know, that's 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 been the tradition over over centuries since the common people took uh, surnames. Uh, but in areas where patronymics were used, the surname was unfixed and instead uh, utilized the father's given name, usually with a with a suffix. That's the quick summary. Michael, elaborate. <laughs> <laughs> and before we before we get into the, the, the nitty gritty of this, a lot of surnames were patronyms, but it was a patronym in the Middle Ages or when surnames started, and then it it stayed the same. It didn't it, change from generation to generation. Correct. Yep. In in areas where patronymics kept being used, last names were not fixed. Uh, in some parts, especially in Sweden, it wasn't until the early of 20th century where last names were fixed and the child had the exact same last name as the father. In areas that we're talking about where patronymics continued into the 19th or early 20th century, children did not have the same last name as the father. The, they would take a last name that was based on their father's last name, hence the joke about Janssen okay. being son of Jan. Um, it's, you know, so we're going to look at some issues with that because nobody has the same last name as the father. 
I had one relative who insisted when they first encountered this that nobody got married to anybody and that they were just doing <laughs> all kinds of stuff. And that's that's not what was going on. It was just it was their common practice to not to use the father's first name as a last name. Continue that on, and it just it looks strange if you're not if you're you know used to the you got to have the same last name as your daddy and your daddy's daddy and forever. <laughs> that's that's not the way it it works. And once you understand it, there there's some logic to it. There's some nuances to it as well that change. But there there is a lot of logic and structure to it once you get the hang of it and kind of let go of this thought that you got to have the same last name as your daddy's pappy or there's something hinky going on. Um, there could be some hinky going there on. There could be something hinky going on, <laughs> but that happens everywhere, not just in places that have patronymics. And as we'll see, it, it's, it, you know, Scandinavians did this, Milo Germans did this, Russians did this, there were other areas of Eastern Europe where they also did this similar process as well. All right, before we go to step one, I would be remiss if I didn't say hello. To our wonderful viewers, hello, Judy um, from Chicagoland. Hello, Cynthia from Plano, Texas. Hey, Paula from down the street. Dr. Shelley Murphy from Central Virginia. Denise Payne catches us today. We missed you, Denise, from the Netherlands. Hello, Donna from St. Albans, West Virginia. Nice to have you. Wanda Looney from Alabama. Hey, Wayne and Grace Ann, nice to see you, hear you, or see your name. Hello, Benita Gale from North Carolina and Marion. Thank you. Um, what's the name made me put on a hat today, Marion? Um, and Denise misses us too. So if you have not said where you are viewing from, please put it in the chat and I'll catch you when we go to our second quick start. Somebody, um, somebody needs to check on Maria Capaldi because she's often the first one here. I want to make I, sure that, I want to make sure nothing's happened to her. So you need to check on her. But Deborah from Ohio is here. Hi, Deborah. All right, let's get started with step one for crossing the patronymic pond. All right, step one is what are patronymic forms. So just to kind of like maybe just like, you know, highlight it again, because maybe, you know, someone didn't hear it. And like me and listen up. That's what Jim said. Pay attention. That's what he said to me in the meeting. <laughs> I'm going to say this one more time, Shabelle. Pay attention. So I'm going to let you guys know before you guys get yelled at. All right. So explain what patronymic forms are and let me know if I could share a graphic or something. Probably any of the any of those three graphics that I sent would fit at this point in time, but a patronymic form is a last name that was derived from the father's first name. Typically, a suffix is added to the end of that. What specific suffix depends upon the area and the language. Um, you know, Russians use a different suffix from the Swedes or the Norwegians, or in my case, the Austrians. Generally speaking, the suffix can mean either son of, daughter of, or, whoa, we're getting flashed there. Or child of. Sorry, um, let me remove that's, that. That's okay. <laughs> um, and the reason why, while we're waiting for the graphic to come up, the reason why we call this crossing the patronymic pond is if your person comes from an area where they're still changing the last name, giving the father's version of a first name as a last name, and they emigrate, sometimes this can create challenges because they might use their their father's last name as their last name sometimes and they might use the patronym sometimes and we've got a few quick examples here on this patronymic form so uh, the, the first two are swedish um, the swedes and the russians uh, would have different last names based on whether it was a son or a daughter so we've got larson and lars daughter son and daughter respectively of lars and Pers, I'm, I may not be pronouncing these 100% correctly. We got Pers son and Pers daughter, son of Per or daughter of Per. Those again are Swedish. I'm not going to pronounce the Russian ones because I'm not going to pronounce those right. But Mikhail, it either ends in an Ovich or an Ovna, depending upon whether it's a son or a daughter. Um, and Myos Frisians there at, at the bottom, they did not distinguish between uh, whether it was a son or a daughter. It was the same last name for, so I kind of called it child of, 
Uh, we got Tammy there for child of Tammy and my mother's maiden name of Ufkus, which literally means child of Ufki. Um, and sometimes they would use E-N, sometimes they would use E-S. For my and my low Germans, it just kind of varied. And it wasn't always the same. My, my mother's maiden name was Ufkus. I've even seen a few families where they used Ufkan instead of Ufkus. Don't ask me why. I don't know. In other names, it was it was consistent. It was a linguistic thing. And the rules, you just kind of have to, in that case, it sounds right. I've seen it some, I, it sounds right. It wasn't quite as consistent as the Swedes or the Russians or some of the Eastern Europeans. All right. So step one, we kind of get an idea of what they are. Um, do we want to is the, the do we want to show another slide on what they are? Or just keep going to the Let's next. Let's keep step? going. We'll we'll see some more examples as we as All we right. go through. That kind of gives so, an overview. Of so it. step two would be then to locate American records of direct line immigrant. So how do you know which immigrant to your your first one who came across the pond, is that first, the one? The first one who came across the pond. And this is something that Jim and I have mentioned in almost any session with immigrants, regardless of what the, the point was about them, you've got to fully and completely research them in the United States. In this case, with the case of the patronyms and the names, we're wanting to see as many records as we can because there might be one record where they use their father's last name and one record where they use their patronym and that can be that can be a huge clue as we'll see if you've got the father's surname and then the patronym then you've got a good idea of what the father's name was based on those two things that's why you want is it's just like anything with an immigrant you want as many references to them in the area where they settled as you can to get the broadest sense of what's going on Every American record you want to want to find for them. And, you know, this is why, like, kind of the classic example might be naturalization, uh, which generally took two steps. And and yet how many people do come up to me and say, oh, yeah, I found their naturalization. And, of course, I say, do you have their first papers and their final papers? Well, blah, 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 blah. and it turns out that they only they only have one or the other uh, because the person that you only research and get one set is where the other set is going to have information. Yeah, to, always to follow up on the blah, 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 blah part, what you want to do, <laughs> Jim makes a good point with the first papers of a declaration of intent and the final papers. You want to get anything where they signed it because mm. they probably signed what they signed might not be exactly what the clerk mm. wrote in the record. A spelling mm. aside, they might have put their full name, their first name, their patronym, and their daddy's surname on the paper yeah. they signed, the part of it they signed. But what the clerk wrote up above, because the clerk got mixed up because he didn't understand all this other name and nonsense, could be an anglicized yep. version of it, which is a clue to. Which is a clue to. I love that. Compare to signature, compare to signature. Beautiful. Man, that's worth the price of admission right there. I love that. And Denise, De Denise makes a good point. In, in, Free in uh, Friesland, which is a close to where my people were from, the, there was an edict in 1810, 1812, that time period. Napoleon said, this changing of name stuff is a bunch of whatever the French word is for a bad word. And so he Steve figured play. That, there you go. <laughs> Um, and so, and so he said, you, you've got to fix the surnames and there was a little bit of rebellion to that. Not everybody did that, but that was the intent was at that point in time, they had to quit this altering every generation stuff. I think his exact quote was in France, we got rid of these 12 Louis ago. <laughs> I think that's step three, learn pre-pawn patronym history of the area. So you want to talk about that a little more? <laughs> this, you know, we can we can talk about what the Swedish Swedes did or the Russians did or the other Eastern Europeans or what the, the Frisians did or what have you, but you've really got to know what your area did. What were the practices in the area of Europe where your people were from? Because just because the Swedes did it one way doesn't mean the Russians did it that way or, the, or wherever the area is from. You've got to learn how it was practiced in the area where it's all about you. It's all about you, really. And we're making a book on that reference. But it, it is. It matters what they did in that area because 
that's the context in which the, the names were created and, and dealt with. In most cases, it was some sort of civil decree by the by the national civil authority that 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 put this transition well, in action. But right. uh, as you'll know, the details on uh, you know a lot of times it was over a number of years. It wasn't right. a wasn't a right now. And the, and the thing is, what what Jim is talking about those edicts because they did the, an edict in Sweden too when they finally got sick of it about 1900, I think. But the the edicts to where you have to stop it are different from those cultural practices which are sometimes they're, they're not the thing is are not written down there's not a guidebook you know when the the priest or the whomever put the child's name in the church register he didn't have a oh well this is the russian guidebook to patronyms in 1728 and here's there or wasn't it was all you know informal and cultural so you've got to get a feel for what was going on in your area and like jim said you've got to know when there was any kind of edict or formal declaration that said surnames now have to be fixed because we're, we're we're just too confused every every other guy is lars svensson yeah <laughs> yes or sven larson yeah that's the other the other f <laughs> so let's move on to step four which is is the patronym a surname or a middle name in some case, if you've got that one slide, there's a slide that um, talks Generations. shows that. Not that one. That's just, that's, just, that's more examples of the patronyms. Um, here we go. Yes. So this is, and the, the Russians have a similar uh, similar system, but in this and this was in Ostfriesland when it was after the edict. You have to have a fixed surname, but they love their patronyms. So the middle name was the patronym. And so going above the bullets for just a second, focusing on that, we've got this dude named Foki Gerdes Tamman. And his children, I made up the first names of them, but they all have their father's last name, Tamman, as their last name. They all have a, a patronym as their middle name, which is Foken, which is the patronymic form of Foki. And so, and some so are Alcha Foken Tamman, Henry Foken Tamman, Frauke Foki Tamman, and Foki Foken Tamman. And I'm not making those names up. Those are real names. But the, the thing is there, sometimes when people see a middle, uh, a last name, quote unquote, as a middle name, they automatically assume that was the mother's the maiden wives. name. And that's that's not the case at all. When you see these siblings all have this folk and tamman as their middle and last name in an area where patronyms was used, that clues you in. Father was very likely first name of Foki and last name of Tamman. And then we can even look, we can even get a clue from Foki Gerdes Tamman, as it mentions in the first part of this, since his middle name, the patronym was Gerdes, we could probably start out thinking that his father was a man named uh, Gerd Tamman. Tamman. Okay, very cool. I think if, you jumped a whole bunch of steps. Right. But... Sorry, but it just kind of was all in the <laughs> flow there. So what does it mean when that? So just okay, all right, all right. So are you and, getting it, Shamel? Are you getting it? I'm I'm a little here and there. Yeah, I'm well, just a little here a, and there. That's an improvement. <laughs> <laughs> so let's move on to to the next step. So we first have to determine whether it's a the, the patronym is a surname or a middle name, and so step five is. If it's the patronym, it is the middle name. You want to research using the father's full name. So we just saw. We just saw that. That's what we. An example saw. of a middle name, middle being the patronym, and I'm just going to show that again. Okay. Especially if you see, you know, if if Alcha is your ancestor there, and you find out she has these siblings, and they've all got this same middle name, then you could start looking for a father. As a man named Folky Tamman, that's no guarantee. That's, that's pretty who cool, it is, you but know. That's, as, right. As much as I hate these things, it's actually pretty cool. <laughs> once you get, once you get that, once, it's, it's like a lot of other things. Once you get the hang of it and you see the, um, you know, the the reasoning behind it, it's it, it's kind of neat. Um, the thing is, you have to be careful because sometimes, if it's in that time period where they're kind of getting away from doing it. 
might not turn out this way. These are clues. These are clues. These are clues. These, these are, clues. These are clues. clues. There's no absolutes, but there's some Correct. probables and you should kind of hang out there. Well, and I, and I would just add, you know, again, in this transition time period, you, they may be known by their given name and then just, just the patronym or right. their given name and just the new fixed surname or as the example that we're showing here have both of them right. uh, so all of those three can be the same person and especially riffing back to the the earlier step in american records especially in american records because remember they're not the records are not being produced with passports and, and air travel in mind they're <laughs> they're they're being produced by by a uh, overworked clerk who just who just wants to write down whatever he he hears and move on to the next. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So that's if it's middle research using the father's full name. We just had an example of that. But then if the surname, if it's a surname patronym, look for the fathers with the appropriate first name. Yep. And this, this is more difficult because you don't have a last name to go with. If you've got a a dude named Foki Tamman born in 1823, um, and maybe you've got a place where he was born in 1823, then you would think that, pro and this is if patronyms is still being practiced in the time period. You got That's always kind of our underlying premise with all of this. Then if his name was Foki Tamman, eight, born 1823, probably his father's first name is Tammy. You don't know what his father's last name is. Right. Um, and you want to... And you want to look for or give priority first to records where the parents might be named within the, the record, like a marriage right. record. Like, or, like, or a death record. Right. Yeah, or yeah, or their death record. Oh, uh, because then then that hopefully will give you that it is, you know, uh, Tammy, uh, Tammy Peterson. Uh, and then then you'll know the the father's uh patronymic name too you, you, but, you really you really mixed up the ethnicities and the linguistics there but i'm gonna let that good. slide um <laughs> good what the, one the, last heck, thing. the <laughs> heck with you ostrisians so <laughs> you made a swedish a, which a, is a, pox, a, pox, a, a pox upon your ostrisians <laughs> one one last thing before before we go to the example because i'm trying to watch our time too i totally forgot now what i was going to say oh in most of these countries where they practice patronymics the records are fairly detailed, church records, that is, and they will name parents in the marriage records as a rule, not always the death records, but usually in the marriage records. Swedish records, Scandinavian records are also excellent in that regard. They'll name the parents in a lot of those records in part because of this confusion about things. That was part of it. All right. So, did you want we want to look at some of these records? Let's you look share. at there. There should be two records. We grab whichever one, and we'll talk about whichever one comes up first. Okay, I could do that. Here we go. This was a. I started looking for this dude when I was just starting my research. I didn't know much about patronyms and all the issues. This individual, his name was Henry Fecht, and Fecht is not a patronym, which is a whole nother discussion. But he was Ostfriesian. His uh, middle name, his patronym was Jakob, which I did not know. And in the 1870s, it took me forever to find him because he was enumerated as Henry Jakobs. And all his children are given the last name of Jakobs in the 1870 census. And that might be because that was his patronym, which he might have viewed as his surname and not the other last name that he had. And so he forever before I found him because I didn't think of looking for him under his mid middle name but he might have viewed that as his last name and the census taker might have been confused because this guy's neighbors might have called him Henry Jacobs because he's son of Jacob and that's who he's supposed to be um and so he's enumerated in the census in that in that way and, and all the first names are anglicized and are other issue altogether but you've got to look from under both those both those names. We often tell people in other groups, always look under the middle name as well. But if your person had a patronym as their middle name, it's key that you think of that as a way they could be listed as the last name. It's just, you've got to think of that. Um, 
because they might have they viewed that in some sense as their last name. So yep. I have his name wrong on here. His name would have been Henry Jacobs Fett. Fett was okay. the last name, and that's that's not a patronym, but that that's a topic for another day. Not all. Okay. You just you just forgot the comma between Fett and and Henry. So yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, Judy asks about where where do we find out about these? And my first play would be Family Search Wiki, uh, yes. because because they will they will uh, usually have a line in there as far as when the decrees went out to uh, to fix the surnames. Great question, Judy. And they they would also have some simple examples of the patronymic forms for yeah. that area as well too. No, oh, I think you have another document for this us. This is the last document. This, oh, this yeah. just makes the point about the middle names. Uh, this is a will from 1877. Uh, his, his name was Mimki Lubenhaben. Um, That's a cool then, name. Mi Mickey Mimki Lubenhaben. And his father was um, Luby. His father's first name was Luby. Um, but anyway, in his will, he names his three children that you see there. The names are underlined. And they all have that same, this is a great example of this, they all have that same middle name. Mm -hmm. Jan Mimken Haben, George Mimken Haben, Ancha Mimken Haben. Mm -hmm. And again, their middle name is that, it's that patronymic form of their father's first name. Now, obviously, in this case, he says they're his children. So establishing the parent-child relationship, you don't have to use the patronymics to do that. But it just makes the point that that's how they're, um, you know, named. And sometimes when we would see those names, we might, especially for a female with a, a name like that, we might think that was her previous her married name. name. Exactly. And it's That's it's exactly not. what I would have thought. So when you're in these areas, don't see those other, quote, surnames, using it in air quotes, for a female. Don't think that's could be a mother's maiden name or a previous married name or her real maiden name or she was born out of wedlock or any of that kind of nonsense. It's, it's, it's a patronym and you've got to keep that, keep that in mind. That is amazing stuff. I think it's, it's starting to come clearer. Like when, oh my gosh, it's starting to make, yes, yes. I don't feel like, you know, that's fantastic. Let's run through the steps. Crossing the patronymic pond. Step one, what are patronymic forms? Understand what they are. Take a look at the Family Search Wiki. Step two, learn American records of the direct line immigrant. That's the first person to jump that pond. Step three, learn pre-pond patronym history of the area. Step four, if the patronym, learn if, determine if the patronym is a surname or a middle name. Step five, if it's a middle name, research using the father's full name. Step six, or five uh, B, if it's surname, look for the father's with the appropriate first name. I love it. I love it. I love it. I can't wait to have an example to practice my skills, my new skills. Jim and Michael, thank you so much. We will see you in a moment <laughs> all right, right. Do you guys get patronyms <laughs> oh my goodness it's a stretch but i'm getting better each time i hear it let's get ready for our second quick start all right a moment that i've been waiting for you know i've always wanted you know, before the pandemic, I've always wanted to have people from all over the country be on my show. And because of the pandemic, I can have every, anybody on my show who's willing, of course. And this lady was so willing and we tortured her with early morning because she's on the Pacific time. I want you to welcome, and she's awake. She says she's awake at this time of day. My buddy, Sheila Benedict. Sheila, how are you? I can't hear you on mute, I think, still. <laughs> oh, I said hi, and I want the hat. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sheila, I forgot to bring a, put our pictures up. I'm all going to put our pictures up. Sheila and I have some hat pictures together. Yes. You know, Sheila and I run into each other mostly down south when... 
you got to have your hat game going on down south or your skin will literally just like burn off, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but Sheila, tell them about let's share the first time we ever, ever met. I've been a fan girl since the first time I met you. OK, um, a very brief history. Years ago, the um, executive director of NGS approached me and Cindy Ingalls about doing a two-year contract for lectures a year. Uh, and she would do the techie stuff. I would do the methodology. And this is dinosaur history, you might say. Anyway, Shamil, Shamel, and I always pronounce it wrong, and I certainly do apologize, uh, was at one of them. And that's the first time I met her. And then a few years later, I walked out of a lecture that I was giving, and here is this gorgeous woman with this gorgeous hat on. And I said to her, where in the world did you get the hat? And she turned around and she said, Sheila? I said, (laughs) Shamil? After all these few years, I should have known it would be you with the hat on. And ever since then, we have really been, we don't, talk often enough as far as I'm concerned, but this is one of the best people I have ever met and will continue to say that she is one of the best people I have ever met. And she wears the best hats I've ever seen. (laughs) She says, wear a hat. And I said, okay. And I come on and she doesn't have a hat. She said, I'm not wearing a hat. I'm not. The only thing I had is my leprechaun hat from St. Francis. Uh, 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 So no, I don't wear hats very good, so although I, I should. I still had regional conferences. Those were actually pretty awesome. I really enjoyed those. But They were. This, they were in I four said. parts of the country yes. uh, every three months for two years. I and si- it was so long ago that Cindy's son, I don't even think he had started preschool yet, to be honest <laughs> with you. So you know how many years ago, because he's either in college or has graduated. So like I said, it's dinosaur years ago. (laughs) And that's our story, and we're sticking with it. (laughs) So Sheila, I ask all of my special guests their one-minute genealogy story. How did you get started, and how did you know that you were hooked on genealogy? Um, put everything in one minute, we'll just strictly say that um, my family lied about everything. Uh, they, um, uh, especially on my mother's side, they were illegal immigrants way back when they didn't make a big deal about it. And my mother's maiden name was not my mother's maiden name. And uh, her ethnicity wasn't her her ethnicity. And I did not realize why there was animosity between the two families till much, much later when somebody Actually, an aunt on my dad's side said, did you ever find your mother's Irish ancestry? And I said, what Irish ancestry? And that really is what set the wheels in motion. So your mother was hiding the her Irish ancestry? Yes, she was. Wow. Wow. But I didn't realize it. But, you know, when she was in the nursing home, she was very senile. And it was either the last time I saw her or the next to the last time. Uh, I walked up to her wheelchair and I woke her up. And she looked at me and said, who are you? And I said, Mom, it's Sheila. It's your daughter. And she, her eyes, her green eyes, and she still had red hair. She, she died at 92 and still had red hair and never touched it up, if you can believe it. Mine I touch up, just so you know. <laughs> Um, uh, and she said, I remember now, I deliberately named you the beautiful Irish name. And then two minutes later, who did you say you were? But at least I got that much out of her. Wow. That sent so, me on my trip. So you, you started on, you know, a lot of people start that way, trying to mm-hmm. get to the truth where their family is just not willing to open up. So good on you for... Um, 
for treading that path and good on your mom. She, she anointed you when she gave you that name. You know, I think she did, but she didn't realize it. And, but one thing I did learn because when I was a kid, nobody got along the two families and they were both jerky. Um, it taught me why. Uh, yeah, and it why. taught me that you you always get along. I don't care what it is. They are family and family yeah. first, in my family opinion. Family first. I like that, Sheila. So let's do your quick start. You want to okay. your quick start? Your quick start is researching Catholic records. So let's... Um, you had this image you wanted me to share for um, your researching Catholic records. I'm going to show it now. Okay. Why was this image important to you, Sheila? Well, because this is First Communion. This is the altar where nowadays the priest faces the, the um, uh, people that are there. It used to be that they would have their back to them. And in the Eastern Rites Church, um, uh, where I was married to my first husband, uh, they had they still had the ba their back to the congregation. So this is the bread and the wine, um, and uh, this is probably one of the most important parts of to a Catholic of being a Catholic and in other uh, denominations as well. Um, and we will touch on that in just a few minutes. Okay. So let's get started with our quick start for researching Catholic records. So step one is to research U.S. civilian records. So yeah, we just want to jump right in, right? <laughs> Right. Well, you know, I won't go through. We don't have the kind of time to go through how important it is to do the civil records. But just remember, before the civil records, such as in California, they didn't start indexing till 1905. And if I wanted to find somebody, like the mission that I worked as the archivist was 1804. I could hardly find anybody in a civil record then. Uh, I had to go to church records. So you want to first get everything you can in the civilian records, because that's really going to help you with the Catholic records, which we'll see. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, that is for any country in the world. So step two is then to learn about Catholic records and the law. So how do you, how do you go about learning? That? Well, I, I, with the law, I'm going to use canon law because all denominations have a form of canon law and the Catholic Church has huge form of canon law. And I've been to several institutes because at one point they wanted me to become a canon lawyer. So I am familiar with the marriage canon law. Um, uh, I did not follow through with that. Uh, I wasn't in the mood to spend six months in Rome away from my family, family first. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, canon law is really and truly, if so the canons are followed. Learn, how do I me? learn about this? Like you said, so me as a researcher, how do I go and learn about, like, like is there a great place to go to learn about? Oh, uh, canon law books are accessible. Okay. Very, very accessible, only very hard to read. Okay. Um, if you, uh, uh, but you know, as far as civil law is concerned, uh, every place is different. The law that I know in Dublin, Ireland is not the law that I know in Los Angeles, California. So when we look at U.S. records specifically, would you say that the, that the law is different from state to state, parish to parish? Absolutely, and county to county and often city to city. You have to know the law of the area in which you are searching. Okay. All right. So that's step two. You know, that's what we normally do as genealogists. You have to get into right. the historical, legal, social aspect. Now, step three is to locate where they live. So if we did step one, which is to find those civilian records, we should know where they lived, right? Well, yeah, to a point. Um, um I was born in Chicago, and it's a very neighborhood-oriented place. And usually a Catholic church 
I was raised in an Irish Italian neighborhood and the local church had only Irish and Italian there. If you were German, you found a German church and that that didn't necessarily mean it was close to where you lived. All right, you so said, you um, said, it's so important to know where you, you live. Pardon so, me? Oh yeah, okay. So you said it's important to know where you lived and go ahead, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, um, I just said, the usual way is that people lived near where their church was. Yes. Okay, that's the usual way. But yes, that's usual. Us. But let's look at you because you have some tricks, and I never, never. So step four is when it can get a little tricky, right? We know where they lived, right? Yes. Now we want to isolate their parish. So you said that's based off of like a lot of different things. So you just said Irish and Italian. You went to the one that was in the neighborhood. Right. Um, uh, there are directories, and I have an example on a yeah. slide that will show you how you might be able to narrow it down. And uh, then besides that one, there are directories for every end. Yeah, there you go. Um, uh, that's an old one. It is published every year. But if you look uh, down below, you've got United States, Puerto Rico, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and if you know where you live and you go to maps, uh, uh, which are very important, along with the law, the maps, the, ge the geography, you can come pretty close to finding out where you might be where you might locate the records on you or your family. So you said something really interesting about ethnicity and location. So we what we might know, you know, we lived on Main Street in this city and I looked in this directory and I see there's one there, but you said that person might not have gone to that church. You said Germans might leave their neighborhood. So talk to us about like- Well, I just used German as an example. I'm not saying they all did because they could, the church near the neighborhood where I lived till we moved to California, uh, you could walk there. Okay. The Catholic school was there and you could walk there. And um, uh so it would be very easy if somebody on the street wanted to go there. Nobody turned them away. It's just, right. you know. Ethnicities um, church together. Yes. And, you know, when people came to this country, they looked for their own, especially if they couldn't speak English. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it was a lot easier to go because it was familiar to you. Um, and uh, of course, back in the day, most masses were in Latin. And uh, I, I can get into something like that for you. Um, the parish where I worked for 18 years was most, uh, there were both Hispanic and English, but way back in the directories, and we'll get into that in a moment, um, um, you, you had to understand a couple of languages. California is different. Uh, there are no neighborhoods. You go where you go, and that's all there is to it. Um, uh, mm -hmm. It doesn't have the neighborhood. I remember going with my cousin, and we hit a street, and he said, I can't cross the street on my bike. We were kids. I said, why not? And he said, that's a different neighborhood. Okay. <laughs> Wow. It, it's, it's, it's a different way. Uh, and I'm sure it's changed from when we were kids, but um, uh, it was a very important, and it still is till today, when somebody gets off the boat or the airplane now, um, and they're in a place where they don't understand one word of English, uh, it's really nice to find people that you can it's communicate with. Yes, yes. Okay. That makes sense. So um, let's see what the next step is. Give me one second. Step. This five. is an important step. To <laughs> locate and evaluate the records. So Why don't you put that first slide up? Here we go. No, no, the one before that that you put up before. With the communion, with the bread and the wine, if you would. 
Okay, here we are with the communion. There. there. What I want to explain is that Catholics aren't the only ones that have communion. Many churches do. And, men, and churches record the people in a lot of different documentation. We're just going to look at in the time we, that it was allotted to us, three of the sacramental registers that are very important. Um, uh, but uh, just remember that it isn't isolated to just the Catholic Church. The Lutherans do a very similar thing as do the Episcopalians and a lot of others. So we can go through the slides if you want now, and I will explain what I've got here. Uh, sure. If you want. So let me, um, sorry, I did not mean to do that. Let me go to your first slide. with a For baptisms. Yes, here we are. Now to me, in the Catholic Church, this register is probably the most important one that a genealogist will ever look at. Yes, it's got the, uh, the, the number in the bapt what baptism register number one number five or whatever and the document number the name of the person that was baptized and notice the latin underneath it so we don't totally lose latin but everything here is in english place and date of birth the date of baptism and that's very interesting because in the old days babies were baptized very quickly after birth they wanted to get them to the church and get them baptized so that uh, they're with God. And uh, nowadays it isn't the same. Uh, a lot of people wait an awful long time before it's done. So uh, what was then is not necessarily what is now. The father's name and the mother's maiden name. And take note of the word maiden name. Every document that I worked on, when I worked at the mission, the mother's maiden name had to be there. And if you're a genealogist and has searched for maiden names, you know how important this would the be. Dream. If, if I got a packet of papers, like from a baptism or a marriage or whatever, and they didn't put the mother's maiden name in, I contacted the family so I could get it and oh, add it really in. Nice. Um, because I knew as a genealogist as well as the archivist how important that maiden name is. And then let's go to sponsors. And the sponsors could be family, could be a business partner, but it could be direct or collateral. And you know, if you do enough genealogy, collaterals yeah. are vital Huge. to doing good research. And then the name of the priest Mm -hmm. um, uh, and who knows, the priest could have been a relative. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's nice to know who the priest is. And they all kept, where I work, they all kept their own book. Um, and they took them, if they left the parish and went to another one, they, they took their book with them. Now, the two that I have the arrows on, and this is why I want to tell you how important this register is, is because in the Catholic Church and canon law, the baptism register takes this information. Now, if you are confirmed in a church in New England or in Germany, um, that record is required to go back to the church of baptism and be recorded in the baptism register. So here you've got movement. You've got paper trail, whether you realize it or not. And then in the last column, um, it, with remarks and everything else, there's uh, when the person is married in the Catholic Church, the non-Catholic marriages are not sent in. But if they're married in a Catholic Church, no matter where in the world it is, it, again, it is sent back to the Church of Baptism and noted. Okay. If they be, if, the, if, Go ahead. So Shamir. Sheila, there was a question that we missed and about the directory. Ed Flowfly wants to know, is the Catholic directory available online? Some of them are. The okay. one that I put up a picture of is one that is purchased by um, uh, parishes every year, and it is horribly expensive. But if you have an area that where you... 
think that, or you know that that's where your family is, I think that the proper thing to do is to check and see if, a, like Illinois, Cook County, Illinois, they put out a wonderful directory all on their own, and I have it in um, my um, directory of, spon of, of different books that I recommend, which we don't have time to go through today, but on lectures that I give on Catholic records, their syllabus material includes books where you might be able to find books. But this one here, if you belong to a parish, even if it's not the parish where your family was, there's a good chance they own a copy of this. But it is, like I say, it's terribly expensive and only Do the libraries churches. libraries have them? Not that I'm aware of unless it's a Catholic library. Okay. So let's, we're running short on time. Let's look at this death register that you. Um, no, let's go back to the birth, to the, the baptism, baptism, because I missed one thing there. Okay. Right. If they join a pr religious order, that has to be sent back. And I was in charge of the marriage tribunal. And I know for a fact, those are highly, nobody can take a look at that packet. But what happens is it goes back to the church of baptism that there was a, a church okay. dissolution of marriage. Okay, we can move on now. Okay. To marriage. I'll hear to, about that paper trail. <laughs> yeah. Paper trail is amazing. So the marriage are, register. Uh, oh, the debt you have death register. Uh, not a whole lot there, but enough that it's a paper trail yeah. because the nearest relatives, um, um, not everybody knows everything. There's an awful lot of misinformation in any of these types of registers, unless it's the person that was actually involved and that's highly impossible in a death register. Uh, I, when my husband died, and we were with, uh, we were at the funeral home. My son told the guy, "Ask my mother; she's a genealogist. She'll give you all correct information." Well, I hope I lived up to my son's standard. But um, um, Did you the sacraments the that they, you know, a lot of times they just have a graveside, so they may not have had any of the sacraments, or they might have. Uh, it just all depends upon what the person wanted and what the family wanted. But you do get the date and place of burial. You get the address of relatives, collateral or direct. So again, you've got a paper trail. So Denise wants to know, are, where'd it go? Here we go. Are, are the uh, churches generous in making records available? Well, I'm going to quote Tom Jones. It depends. <laughs> Um, some are, some aren't. Where I worked, I li worked in a private archive, and um, anybody that was related to a person that had a sacrament done there, I would give a certificate to. Some churches are very open. You have to call, find out, or maybe the records are at the diocese or the archdiocese. And they're willing, they have an archive where they're willing. So it all depends. You have to check the area and see how forthgiving they are. All right, thank you so much for that, Sheila. Would you like to share, talk about the marriage register? I would. All right, let's take a look at a marriage register. Again, date and place of baptism is on the marriage record, where they lived. And of course, you get the bride's maiden name and where it says parents. If the bride's mother's maiden name isn't there, I contacted them and asked for it. <laughs> because again, uh, I'm a genealogist and witnesses to the wedding. Very often it's a sibling. And I've seen it where parents have been witnesses as well when, um, and the priest that married them. Uh, and this information goes back to the baptism, a uh, church of baptism as well. So again, your paper trail is backing wow. into your baptism. 
Um, so it's, uh, it's amazing. This is not stuff you learn in Catholic school. No, this is stuff you good. learn. And, and, and unless you have utilized these books, you won't ever know about this. Uh, fortunately, I worked there for 18 years and I am extremely familiar with it. And, um, I went out of my way to make sure because I am a genealogist. I used to even, if there was a first communion and it's not required to record it in the baptism record, I, you I recorded record it. <laughs> Go for you. <laughs> we wish all archivists of um, these records would do that. Julie, you mentioned something to me uh, just now that uh, earlier that was a little concerning. Um, and it made me think of my great grandmom, who I believe at one time was a secretary and she took minutes and she took the minute book home with her. And, you know, we don't have that minute book. <laughs> it did not survive. So you said that the priest take the baptism books with them? No, no, they don't oh. take the baptism books. Oh, okay. Uh, they take their own notes, their own they notebook. Their notes. So they we, are, they oh. never take the sacramental registers. Okay. Although funny story, and I don't know if we've got time, but I went to a too. church in um, Ireland because I go there every year. And because it didn't have an archive, this one church, the priest kept the Sacramento registers under his bed in the condo about two blocks away from the church. And he brought them out for us because we went over there and he brought them out. And um, uh, so one never knows, you know, the old saying, never say never. Never say never. But the records are, ha are supposed to stay with the okay. so diocese, the arch, et cetera. I misheard you. And so I'm glad I asked you that question. No, so am I. <laughs> so Sheila, that was fabulous. I think I've learned some, uh, my brain was not screwed up by patronymics and I did, you know, ingest some Catholic record stuff. So let's take a look at the steps that you shared for researching Catholic records. Step one, of course, you want to research U.S. civilian records first. Absolutely. Step two, learn about Catholic records and the law. Step three, locate where they lived. Step four, isolate their parish. Step five, locate and evaluate the records. Thank you, Sheila, for that. You're welcome. We're going to bring Michael and Jim back on. And we have our question of the day. What was that question of the day, Michael? The question of the day <clears throat> was, have you purchased an ancestral artifact at an auction, at an antique store, other than that of a relative? Not, not you know, something in a store, someplace, not when a relative was selling it, but a non-relative selling it. So who would like to respond? I'll go first. I'll go first. Yeah, okay. I've, I have I uh, have purchased some baptismal certificates uh, from a broker that, uh, you know, was not a relative and they were not a direct line ancestor. They just were uh, probably someone in the family. And they sold them to you? Yeah. <laughs> was this like eBay? Or um, uh, it was, it, it, no, it was a it was an antique dealer. Michael, uh, we have thirty seconds. Uh, did you get that image to load I up? I did. Here it comes. I love this. This is my this lady was my great great grandfather's sister, the antique dealer who found this. I'm not quite sure how she got it, but she reached out to me via email. I said I was a relative. It was his sister, and I. Uh, purchased it. It's been about 20 years ago. That That's an immigrant trunk from about 1869, 1870. I love it. Say the first name. Alcha. It's not spelled right, but it's, it's Alcha. A -L it's supposed to be A-L-T. Beautiful. Seconds, seconds, seconds. I have seconds. All right, guys. Thank you so much for this, Sheila. Oh my gosh. Thank you for being on today. We appreciate you being here You're watching welcome. us. Have a fantastic day. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.